Well, nevertheless, before we talk about any of the modern wrestling, you know, every time lately that we talk about a WWE program, because it's epidemic there, I mean, AEW is all over the page. Sometimes they'll start a match and go right to break when you wish you could see it, and other times they'll start a match and stay with it to the point where you're like, please, I'll, I'll hurt children if you'll just let this stop. But the WWE has a habit of starting a match and doing some kind of allegedly gripping spot, big dive, big bump, big whatever, where then they go to break in like 90 seconds or two minutes or whatever, and then there are commercials for three and a half or four minutes. And I think it disrupts the flow of the match, obviously. And, you know, as as well, I think you see these entrances that are interminable and the interviews that go on forever and even the ring introductions sometimes if they do in-ring intros last longer than the match does on camera sometimes even in both segments so we always say that diminishes and i think it does it diminishes the importance of the match and then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy and i think that's why a lot of people sit on their hands in the WWE audience because they're conditioned. The only time that something really good is going to happen is in the live interview with the stars where they get in a fight and they're looking for entrances and sing-alongs and the match is like the time that they sit there and tolerate it or they get up and take a piss. Is that in any way, Brian, have I communicated this appropriately? I think so. I mean, it's a frustrating thing about watching WWE TV, and it seems like there's a pattern where you watch the pay-per-views, and unless it's one with just stinky matches, the pay-per-views are usually pretty good, and it's usually predominantly wrestling. Yes. And then you get excited, and you go to the next night on Raw, or two nights later on Raw, and it's right back to 80 to 85% talking, and then another 5% of backstage talking and then maybe 10% in the ring, and maybe one of the three matches will be one that anyone would care about, and that match will be cut up by commercial breaks so that it's it's almost impossible to actually watch and enjoy. Well, and so anyway, the point I was making with that is that I always say, huh, two minutes to break, and I complain about that and the formatting of the show, and I've mentioned it a few times, but I went back and got an old format um, this is an OVW format, but Smoky Mountain Television could have been the same thing. Ring of Honor Television, same basic principle. We had longer matches on Ring of Honor Television than were in the territory days on TV and more competitive matches, and really longer matches than we had in OVW because OVW, I wanted to get most of the guys that were full-time on in the program exposed on TV and also didn't want to have a constant diet of 20-minute matches in a wrestling school promotion. But the point is there's ways that even with TV limitations, you can allot your time to where your points get made and you still give time where it's needed to wrestling or give time where it's needed to fucking telling a story. And one of my favorite programs, I've mentioned it before, but not in a television formatting viewpoint, it was the OVW television where we finally did the loser leave town match between Doug Basham and the Damage. And this was because both of them, as the Basham brothers, were being called up to the main roster in SmackDown. This was August of 2003. and. But even though they were both going, because I've told this story before, they had been a tag team, a heel team, for like a year, year and a half, and were fantastic and excelled at everything. (laughs) And they wouldn't bring them up to the main roster. So finally, for our business uh, and Six Flags events that summer, I switched Damage a Babyface on Doug Machine and started a program between the two of them, and that's when they decided to call them up as a tag team. So I was having to explain why 
even though they were being seen on SmackDown as alleged brothers and partners, they were at each other's throats in OVW, and I had the somewhat the benefit that the crowd had been with us for a long time, and they'd seen these guys over the years, so they knew they were both local, and they knew that there was some jealousy in the past, and we just told the story that Basham had, had talked his uh, valet Nikita into romancing John Laurinaitis into bringing Damage to SmackDown as Basham's partner in an effect, uh, in an attempt to humiliate him and get him to quit wrestling. And I did not know that my angle in 2003 was prefacing <laughs> real life goddamn events that would take place with good old John Laurinaitis a decade and more later. But I did it first, folks. So, to, hey, you think developmental didn't have cutting-edge broadcasting and booking in those days? Uh, penis power. As I swear to you, and you know what? The anniversary show that we did the next month after this TV, we did our anniversary in the new arena, and Laurinaitis appeared there in a tag team match. <laughs> I presented him as the guy <laughs> that, was, that was in charge of... <laughs> basically turning all of your favorite uh, to the OVW fans. I said, this is the guy that's in charge in the WWE of giving all your favorite OVW wrestlers, these horrible gimmicks and burying them. And when he came out, he had more heat than he had ever had in a wrestling event in his life. And he did <laughs> anyway, nevertheless. So on this night, I had one piece of business there was the main point of the program was the loser leave OVW match, the ultimate blow off between these two guys that had been in the past, they'd been enemies. Then they joined together as a group and been partners and champions. And now they've split up and good has to triumph over evil in, in my universe in this instance. And that, that was what the TV show was built around. We had one other match. And I'll explain why in a second when I go over the format. But just so you know, the opening dark match that night, August 2nd, 2003, well, that, that was the date that it aired. So that was a Saturday. The Wednesday night we taped it would have been, what, July 30th. The opening match was Aaron the Idol Stevens and Mike Mondo against Matt Capitelli and John Hennigan. Later to be known as Johnny Thunder, Johnny Nitro, Johnny Impact, Johnny... Johnny Johnny the pumpkin eater every but anyway and then we start the program and as i said we've got one other match which is for the southern tag team title that's our tag team championship and since the rest of my television is being built around blowing something off i wanted to keep something going that we were having not only on our regularly on our television program, but is leading to Six Flags and live events around the area. And it was the Disciples of Sin, Seven and Bane, against Tank Tolan and Chris Cage, the team known as Adrenaline. And Nova was in their corner because he had a legitimate leg injury and was still on crutches at this point. He'd had knee surgery. But he was their babyface mentor and had kind of started the team and then tank came along and took his place when when he was hurt so we start with a cold open which is basically a vtr interview from the disciples saying that they intend to regain the southern tag team championship from these weasels here tonight on the program we fly that right into our open and we've got we're a minute and a half into the program I don't want to waste time. So we come right out of the open. And that's the, obviously the open is the animated open with the music, the theme and the highlights flashing around. And we're immediately playing the heels music. And here they come. You see some of the talent on camera as and coming in dressed to wrestle. As soon as you come out of the open while the announcers, that would be me and Dean Hill billboard the program hello welcome tonight you're going to see an historic match in the davis arena here in louisville as we say goodbye to one of two of our all-time greatest stars blah 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 but right now in the ring 
for the Southern Tag Team Championship. Here's the challengers. Boom, we go to the ring an announcer, and they're introduced. That takes 45 fucking seconds. I know they didn't have to walk through an NBA arena. But they get their music, they get their beauty shot, a quick ring introduction, and then fade the music. Here comes the baby faces. And they enter and they're introduced. And now we are three minutes into our program and we're ringing the fucking bell. And because the, again, the main thrust is the main event, I want these guys to have a good little tag team match with some action leading to a complete brawl because we're building to a fucking street fight kind of match and blah, blah, blah. So I've even got the notes on the back of this format. Uh, I won't go through the whole thing, but for timing purposes, I give them six minutes to have a match. That means that the baby faces shine for about two minutes. They do some nice tag team spots. And then I gave him a heat spot, which was Cage go to shoot seven off, seven blind tag Bane, reversal, seven drop down Bane spine buster. Boom. Nice tag team move, but behind the referee's back by the heels. And now I gave him notes. You got about a minute and 45 seconds. Get some fucking heat. And I used to tell the guys, you need to be able to hit time cues on TV, especially down to a quarter of a minute. So we would time everything in 15 second increments. Also, it was easier to count in my head. But if you could hit cues within your 15 second parameters and start to learn how to do it in your head, then you were good for live television because this was live to tape. We couldn't post produce. We've talked about that. We didn't have the budget. Anyway, they get a minute and 45 of heat, and they get a minute and 45 cue to go. That means that at one minute and 45 seconds before they're supposed to be out of there, they get a cue from the referee that says, go home. And if they do exactly what we have discussed in the right way without milking anything too long or getting lost or rushing through it and being too quick, then they'll come out even. And basically, that was the finish was hot tag to tank, comeback, false finish seven, Bane save, cage into Bane, tank headlock seven, seven shoot tank off, sin trip, seven on tank, Nova around, nail sin. We could hit women back in those days. Seven headlock tank, tank shoot seven off. Now he's coming where Nova is. Nova trips him with his cane. So they've done tit for tat. Bane blinds Cage, dives out, gloms Nova. Tank comes out on Bane. Seven comes out on Tank. Cage comes out, grabs the cane, and clears the heels out. Referee calls for the bell, no contest, and the heels bail to the entryway. Baby faces protect Nova. That's a minute and 45, and they did it. Boom, and we're on time, because did I mention we're live to tape? We can't post-produce. I know that was relatively quick, but either for that or for the rest of the show or any show you did for OVW, although you're the commentator, what notes, if any, were there specifically for commentary? Like, what no, were you talking about during that match? Are you talking about the big main event to come or the thing that's happening right in front of you? Again, it's only a minute 45, so you could only do so much. Oh, no, you're calling the... F See, here's the thing. And by the way, this these were the notes for the talent. If you went to OVW, that's the way you got to finish. And if I had to fucking slow down and goddamn walk you step by step through it, I gave you fewer finishes. So guys learned, hey, that's you ought to heard Flair call a fucking finish for a goddamn match. Hey, you do the ding and the ding, and he's making motions and slapping his shoulder, and I'll give you the deal, and here we can, yeah, the deal, and boom, double bridge, and there you go. That was a fucking finish from Flair sometimes. But anyway, there were completely separate announcer notes. But yes, at the start of the match, I would, obviously, we would establish that the match was going on, what the stipulations were, it was for the tag team title, blah, blah, blah. Then I would also talk about the big main event and how we're going to be seeing throughout the program highlights from this long-running rivalry. And then I would have been calling the action, except then, boom, when the heat spot happens, then you start paying more attention to the heels and drawing a little bit more sympathy for the baby faces 
but you can still drop in things like, and of course, Six Flags this Friday night, we're looking for a great crowd. Oh, there's a big spine buster, whatever. But once you see them going into the go home sequence, you're on that because that's the story that you want the viewer to be left with. So as soon as they went into that, I would have been calling what was happening and illustrating, oh my God, sin is, and see that I'd already given sin instructions, don't interfere throughout the match because she's going to trip in the finish. When she does the trip, boom, then here comes Nova. You've got to make sure that people know, oh my God, here comes Nova on that crutch. He's got one bad leg, but he pops her. And she takes the big bump, but right then the baby faces are about to give the heels a taste of their own medicine. When the heel comes right to where that the baby face was tripped by sin, Nova's there to trip him. You've got to, ah, tit for tat. And then they all just get in the goddamn schmaz, and the referee has no choice but to count them out. And it's not a fucking one minute count out. You have four guys plus a guy with a cane and a woman wailing away at each other. You're not going to stand there and count like they do in AEW. You're going to give a legitimate 10 count while the people are up and the action's going on. And the bell, and the bell and hearing that is what settles the fight down in some instances when they go, what happened, what happened? Jesus. Anyway, you're ready for SEG 2. Yes. <clears throat> and once again, this is a one-hour program. And the television station got four and a half minutes of commercials. Of course, a one-hour program in television is either 58, 30, or 59 minutes. We were doing 59. So TV station gets four and a half. That means we've got 54, 30, and we have approximately four and a half minutes of commercials, although sometimes in busy seasons I would steal an extra bit of commercial time in program content. But that means that basically we're, we're shooting... 48 to 50 minutes of program time. So again, and also this is, I know this is not a network or national cable budgeted production. We, yes, that gives you the incentive to use more bells and whistles and take up time here and there with all the money you can spend, but we were getting to the meat of the matter and telling the story. We come back at the top of segment two to the announce desk where Dean Hill and myself Again, preface, one of the most historic matches in the history of OVW will take place tonight. One man will leave. Either Doug Basham, Machine, or the Damager. Two men who have, you have seen here from the start of their careers. Let's take a look back at the rivalry that began from a friendship. Boom. And we've got a 9 minute and 45 second history package going all the way back to, and the people knew the story. Doug Basham was Danny Davis's nephew. He was also the first person that Danny Davis trained as a wrestler when he retired. And he was the first top guy in OVW when it was a very small, independent promotion wrestling school here in the mid-90s in Louisville. And then... Basically, the story that we told retroactively when Doug Basham came back to OVW about two and a half years before this was that Doug Basham had become... Actually, what happened was Doug Basham got a job at Ford and they moved him to a shift where he couldn't work the wrestling shows, but he was making nearly $100,000 a year, some ridiculous amount of money, right? So he had to quit wrestling for quite a while. But when he came back, we retroactively told the story that Doug became jealous of Danny Davis's relationship with his second student, Nick Dinsmore, who was the second top guy in OVW. And as a result, when Doug had come back to the company, he came under a mask as machine and leading a group called the Revolution that was trying to take over the company and he was dropping veiled hints about his birthright, how he was promised that he would be part of this. And later on, when he was unmasked by Dinsmore, Danny Davis' surrogate son, he then revealed that he said that Danny had promised him part of the company years ago. And Danny revealed that 
Doug Basham was a jealous bastard of Nick Dinsmore and had left and blah, blah, blah. So we had all this shit going on. And then Damager comes in as the fourth student behind Rob Conway. See, all these guys, everybody talks about the, the class of 2002 and Brock Lesnar and Batista and Randy Orton and blah, blah, blah. These were the guys that I was basing my program around and were drawing the money in OVW because they'd already been trained and they were already established. And we were teaching these other guys from scratch. And so while they went on to be Hall of Famers, they couldn't sell pussy on a troop train in their first week in wrestling school. Cena was different because he could talk. But anyway, so Damaja and uh, agrees to join forces eventually with Basham against because Damage has always been that kind of guy, that wild fucking loose cannon, against Dinsmore and Conway, and you got the family feud, right? So we do a 10-minute history package, going back a year and a half with clips and highlights and video of all the things that have gone on. And then I stole researched an idea from was it Cena and Rock or who was it that they did in like the early 2000s one or so they did or maybe Austin and Rock the my way or the highway video you remember what I'm talking about I do you but I don't you're remember special yeah I the... can see it in your eyes yeah they, shitty song by Limp Biscuit. I forget it would I may have been Austin well, yeah, but nevertheless, it makes a great fucking wrestling video. So I sat up all night one night over at the arena and edited a fucking Damage and Machine video, the same song. And we played that to the television audience while in the arena, because we didn't have screens, and we also weren't going to have people come to the live event to watch goddamn television. We had Molly Holly versus Jillian Hall in a dark match, and John Heidenreich against Mike Bell. And the people were happy as clams live in the building. And then we came back in segment three, very briefly, a short segment to set some things up and to not bore the people while in the dark, in the dark, while in the arena, not televised, we set up our chairs and got our things set up for the main event. We just had locker room interviews for 30 or 45 seconds apiece with both camps, Damage and all of his seconds, the OVW uh, originals that were behind him, the baby faces. And then we go to the heel locker room with Machine and his members of the revolution. And they both say, well, we hope that we're going to win, but if not, you know, they say their goodbyes. And Jillian Hall, she was cute then, 19 years old or whatever. She gives Dinsmore a little kiss on the cheek. It was so fucking... Sweet. Looked like Shirley Temple back then. Anyway, and then we play the rules package for the home audience. This match, because it calls for it, is no time limit and no disqualification, something that you don't normally see, almost never saw on OVW television. And it's not because it's going to be a street fight or a garbage match. It's because that's the way that traditionally you promised the fans there will be a winner. Nobody's going to be disqualified and nobody's going to be counted out and they're not going to go to a draw, right? And then what's next for a heel to fuck somebody? A run-in, right? So the stipulation of this match is that all parties in the revolution will be handcuffed to an opposite member of the OVW contingent. So you had Rob Conway handcuffed, I believe, to Nick Dinsmore. You had Matt Morgan, a seven foot giant, handcuffed to Mark Magnus. You had Jillian Hall handcuffed to Nikita. You had Johnny Jeter handcuffed to Smooth Johnny Spade, all of them at ringside. And the referees, Robert Briscoe and Ray Ramsey, would have the handcuffs. So the match has been set up to where it's a fair fight and the heel cannot cheat and it's the biggest stakes possible on the line. Also, for did I mention, for the OVW Heavyweight Championship and the loser leaves. 
you don't need to put hats on a hat in your match when you have all the stipulations that sell the match for you. If they'd opened up, we couldn't do blood in Kentucky anyway, but if they'd opened up now bringing in chairs and chains and sticks and beating each other over the head, then that's a hat on a hat. Now it's down to a fucking contest and they can work, right? And segment three, 30 seconds a minute, minute and a half, minute 45, two and a Segment three with the locker room interviews and the rules package was two and a half minutes. I'm putting time in the bank because you have to take commercial breaks on television. I understand that. There's TV commitments, but it's how you allot your time. And if I'm going to have a long match later, I do a short segment earlier in the program. Then segment four, here's the heel music, the heel group comes out not the top heel but the heel group and they are introduced in 30 seconds and then you cross fade to the baby face group music and here comes the baby faces and they're introduced and the referees then handcuff all the parties before you see the participants so everybody understands what's going on and that just took well actually the referees were not like, I should have had Dean Hill handcuffing everybody. He can snap them on you. The referees were, were a little slow with the handcuffing, but that was less than two minutes for two introductions of two groups and some handcuffing. And then you play the damage of music because even though he's the baby face, he's the challenger. He's coming out first. He gets a big entrance, but no introduction. We're going to do that in the ring. When we come back, folks, the most important match ever. And I've gotten another short segment of one and a half, two and a half minutes. But I've put that in an area in the show where I got both those commercial breaks in the same quarter. So I wasn't fucking breaking myself to death. And our breaks on local television were only a minute or a minute and a half because I could put my commercial spots where I wanted as long as I gave the station their four and a half minutes. So we didn't stay gone too long. Am I boring you yet, Brian? Not yet, but keep going. All right, you'll, you'll get there soon. And then in seg five, we get down to the meat of the matter. Here comes the heel. As soon as we come out of break, his music is playing and you see him. Doug Basham Machine enters, and then Dean Hill does the in-ring introductions and the referee gives the on-microphone instructions to both men. And you realize it's no time limit, no disqualification, blah, 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 but the loser will leave OVW. And all of that that I just described takes about two minutes, and now I've got nine minutes from bell to break because I've saved up some of my time. And this match starts, and... In this instance, these guys were graduates of the program. I didn't make any notes. I didn't give them. They knew who needed to go over, and I told them to work out their match. And when I was able to do the format, I told them basically how much time they had. So they worked it out there, and the only other thing that I told them was get your heat spot in the middle so that we can go to break on it. And that's what they, and we gave them a cue because uh, by that point we had the referees wired. So we gave them a cue every minute, counting down. And this was like their, what do they call it in college? The graduate thesis where guys that have gone through this program, they're allowed to call their own match. They're told how much time they've got. They're given cues, counted down eight minutes to break, seven minutes to break, or however we gave it to them. And they got to have their match and hit their cues. And that they had one of the best matches we've... And remember, on OVW television, we did have Kurt Angle a time or two. And we had Benoit. And we had a, a number of great talents, but this was one of the best OVW matches that we ever had on television. They tore... And the place was... Not only do we have every seat full, but we this was the one of the nights we had the friendly fire department that wasn't going to 
turn us in or get us in trouble. So they were standing all the way to the fucking ticket counter. And every, as soon as the lockup, they were with this thing through the whole deal because they knew these guys, they knew the history, and they knew something was happening. So it was a great fucking crowd. But anyway, they go the nine minutes and they do their heat spot and we go to the break with Damage and Jeopardy. And I can pitch, ladies and gentlemen, we've got to take a commercial timeout, but please don't go away. Damage's career, his, his livelihood in OVW is in Jeopardy. We'll be right back. Boom, that's a way to hook them. And if we're gone for a minute and a half, and then hopefully they had time to piss, but they come back and then you just do a reset. Folks, during the commercial break, Basham has stayed in control, but damage of fighting valiantly. And then they had another nine minutes. So they got 18 bell to bell. And at that point, they were getting an every one minute cue. But I see I have my note here is I asked him, I said, how much time do you want for your go home cue? The go home cue, as I said earlier, that's when when you hear go home, you start whatever sequence that you're going to go through to go into your finish. And you better have that one. That's the most important timing. They said, give us four and a half minutes. Okay, boys, you got it. And that's a, that's a, uh, I guess that's not as impressive sounding when nobody knows what the fuck the reason why that's impressive is, but if you want a four and a half minute cue, that means you've got a lot of shit to do and you you need to nail it, right? And they did. And damage of one with his finish off the top turnbuckle, the chokes, hanging choke slam double thing, sit down, boom, one, two, three. And the place blew and the referees unlock the heels. And the fans are standing and cheering. And that's when I say, because I've saved five minutes left on the air. One minute for our break and four minutes for the final segment. So I can say, folks, we're going to get a word with the winner, the new OVW champion, just a, in one minute, stay with us. And we go to the spots and we come back. Damage and the baby faces are at the desk. And, of course, he vows that the damage in OVW will never die. Of course, he was leaving, too, but evil had to be vanquished. And I didn't want to fucking trap myself into not being able to bring Dano back because he was a hot baby face for us. So he just kind of faded a few weeks later for the fans' you know, uh, knowledge. But they do the interview at the desk, and then we send... Send it up to the ring with Dean Hill to interview the loser, the former champion. And there Basham admits he got beat, he lost. It was a valiant fight. He meant everything about the revolution, but now it's over. The revolution is over. And then Conway says, no, it's not. What the fuck are you talking about? It's over, Rob. We lost. You Fuck, you lost. I didn't lose. And then the rest of his people jump on, bash him, and kick the shit out of him. And as they're kicking the shit out of him, who else is going to help him? He's got no... He's been a heel. He's got no friends in the babyface locker room. The rest of the heels are feeding on him. Here comes the damager. And he clears the ring of the fucking heels because they had at one time been the closest of friends. And people think now, oh, now they're going to hug. Brian, guess what they did? They hugged. No, they didn't. Oh, they fought off. No, they didn't. <laughs> Damager ran the heels off and went over and fucking reached out and fucking pulled Doug to his feet and then looked at him and turned around and walked off. It's like, I've got respect for you, but you still ain't my fucking best friend anymore. And right then, as we bring up Basham's music so that now he's alone in the ring and the people can now, because they've got the official permission to, because he's a baby face, the heels just turned on him. Now the people stand up and give Basham the standing ovation as his music plays. But wait, 
there's more because we timed it well, we didn't time it the guy that was timing it was danny davis and i told danny i said with 30 seconds left be rolling in and as soon as Danny comes through the door and the people see him, they're already cheering. Now they blow and the babies go because Danny rolls in. And the last 30 seconds of this television program is the reunion of the uncle and the nephew that started OVW on the nephew's last night as he's just been driven out and they hug and Danny raises his arm, that Doug's arm, and off we go. It's not that fucking difficult. You you can you don't have to go to break every time the goddamn match starts a minute later. You don't have to put a hat on a hat and gimmick everything up where just because it's no disqualification. I think the worst thing they did was one guy hit the other guy with a garbage can when they spilled out on the floor and i think of a few times somebody went for a pile driver or whatever the fuck but they didn't need to do hardcore because the issue was set up the people couldn't got any hotter and then when you build something and present it you need to make sure that the people understand the history behind it why it's important what the stakes are what the stipulations are what both guys' opinion or viewpoint is on the match, and then have the fucking match and give the match the most prominent position. It's not that hard. Who taught you how to do formats? Where did you learn how to do formats? And how eye-opening was it from when you went from Memphis to Mid-South to see how things were done? <laughs> Well, I've I've told you, I started actually doing formats, not from scratch, but writing them, transcribing them. When Teeny used to have me keep track of if the Louisville station was playing their interviews correctly and giving them all their time. Because, I mean, Nick sometimes used to send tapes in those days that sometimes the station would just cut off like eight minutes at the end. I don't know if it's because the tape was unusable or they were fucking around. But anyway... So I would transcribe the stuff and I got used to being at timing and seeing where breaks were and how long segments were. And then obviously Memphis TV was the first time I saw segments and it was, or formats. And I've said even, you know, they didn't put anything on paper in those days that if you found it could be in any way incriminating. So it was literally desk interview so-and-so ring match so-and-so versus so-and-so and they'd have the time on it. And, you know, whatever. There was no details. But it was all laid out verbally. And you just had to retain it and know what people were talking about. And then going to, you know, Mid-South, where it wasn't that the formats were more complicated in writing because there still wasn't a lot of shit written down that could be found and used against the business. But it was now we're taping two shows in one night. And we've talked about Mid-South Wrestling. There was the bicycle of tapes around the territory because they had so many regular towns they ran every two weeks that they had to stagger the television program. If we shot it on May 1st, it would air the following weekend in three or four of the markets and the following weekend after that in three or four more. And, and it'd take five weeks to get all the way around the horn. So we had to keep up with what number program had aired most recently in that market so we wouldn't do anything or say anything that hadn't aired on television yet even if it had been shot and in the pre-internet days not a soul knew what the fuck had happened in Shreveport at the boys club so that was where I started learning how to not only keep track of the formats but pay particular attention to how you know things were timed and everything and then you know, with, with the WCW creative team, especially with, with Clash of Champions, we're live. So even though it was loose, it was looser than this because it was two and a half hours, that's the first live program that I ever formatted. You know, and, and obviously I was getting input on, Rick, how long do you want for your match? I'll put it on paper. 
and whatever. But then I had to put all the bells and whistles in the middle of it, figure out where the interviews would go or how long they might take. And in Smoky Mountain Wrestling, I got to where I, that's the only math that I can do in my head flawlessly is counting time. Now I can do it on the fly. And so, so much time spent in the truck and TNA and Ring of Honor and having to, you know, when the producer says, I said, well, what was the time on seg four? Eight minutes, 42 seconds. Okay, we're 42 seconds heavy. Before we come back up, I got to figure out where the rest of the program, we can cut 42 seconds. Uh, take 15 off the goddamn entrance. We'll pick it up halfway down the aisle and give them their cue in the match 30 seconds early. See what happens. Boom. Shit like that. Does any of that make any sense? I think it makes sense. Again, that was a big show. I'd like to hear one of these days you should do just an average show where there wasn't. I don't know, do a, average shows, kid. Oh, you know what the hell I'm talking about. <laughs> Instead of a multiple year story culminating on a big show. A show more than the Well, I, I grabbed that one because that was an important match. And and I will do and I'll do another one next week if you want or whenever. But especially when they have an important match, it just drives me crazy when they've got to this point and they they think it's that's like starting the seventh game of the World Series and deciding halfway through the first inning, oh, we got to sell some fucking feminine hygiene products. I'd like to hear you do one from the early days of Smoky Mountain when you were trying to establish everything, who the wrestlers were, who the stars were, the promotion, the towns. Maybe next time you could do one of those. Well, send me some notes on what you want to you want to hear and I'll I'll tell you what you want to hear. <laughs> okay. Who's going to tell you what you want to hear? Well, I'll tell you what, sometimes you just need somebody to talk to. And to be honest with you, after writing, what was it, 300? No, I think it was 310 OVW television programs, weekly programs in a row. I wish I'd known about BetterHelp, but they weren't our sponsor then. Like, they're, they're our sponsor now. They sponsor this program and so many of our other shows, but they weren't my sponsor back then. They would have given different meaning to the word being my sponsor at that point if I'd had better help. But folks, if you're pulling your hair out of your head because you're writing a live-to-tape, low-budget television program for a local wrestling school or any other reason, our friends at BetterHelp can help you out. Because as we've mentioned so many times before, we've heard it from so many of the listeners in the cult of Cornette, especially during the pandemic. They didn't have as much communication with other people as they wanted they needed somebody to talk to to learn something about themselves or how they're dealing with things or how their life is changing and get some feedback it's self-awareness which i understand well and sometimes they even have coaches for that kind of thing now from what i've been told brian where you're coached to be more self-aware well therapy does that and you wouldn't even have to drive to the coach you can do it right online with better help until you talk through things, you do not know what you want or why you react the way that you do. And BetterHelp connects you with a licensed therapist who can take you on the journey of self-discovery, which is cheaper than ever now. The gas prices are going down, but self-discovery uses less uh, miles per gallon than regular driving. Were you aware of that? Sorry, my Brian, mouse. are you on mute? My mouse stopped working. <laughs> I, uh, I don't know what I'm aware of. I don't even know what you're talking about, but my mouse is back. It's working. Your again. mouse is back. Well, if your mouse needs somebody to talk to also, the journey of self-discovery is what we were talking about there. And, and you know, I've often heard when I was a child, journeys of self-discovery would make you go blind, but that turned out to be just an old wives' tale. But folks, if you're thinking of starting therapy, give better help a try. It's entirely online and designed to be convenient flexible and suited to your schedule you go to betterhelp that's h e l p betterhelp.com and fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched up with a licensed therapist and you can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge it's more affordable and more convenient than standard in-person therapy so you can discover your potential now go to betterhelp.com/jce and get 10% off your first month's services. Betterhelp.com slash JCE. 10% off 
off your first month's services and tell them that Jim Cornette and his OVW television PTSD sent you.